Hello and welcome to Corpus Cast, part of the Aston Originals family, providing fresh perspectives from Aston University experts. My name is Robbie Love, and I'm a lecturer in English language here at Aston University. I'm a corpus linguist, meaning that I study linguistic patterns, trends, and variation using large samples of language data. Now, Corpus Cast is a show all about corpus linguistics and what it can do for society. Uh, in this new series, I'll be speaking with top researchers in the field to find out more about how corpus linguistics can be applied to a diverse range of areas, including health, social justice, education, and many others. In this episode of Corpus Cast, our topic is how corpus linguistics contributes to research about education. I'll be speaking to Pascual Perez Paredes, Professor of Applied Linguistics and Linguistics at the University of Murcia in Spain. Pascual has research interests in learner language variation, the use of corpora and digital resources in language education, and more recently, corpus-assisted discourse analysis. Uh, today, we'll be having a chat about his work in applying corpus linguistics to a range of educational contexts. So I'm very pleased at this time to welcome Pascual Perez Paredes to Corpus Cast. Pascual, hello, welcome, great to see you. Hi, Robbie. It's great to see you. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you you coming on to Corpus Cast to have a chat. Um, we're going to start with uh, a couple of questions about uh, your own relationship with Corpus Linguistics. We'll try to, um, uh, and I ask all my guests that this question to, to explain in general terms um, how uh, Corpus Linguistics is involved in your work. What does Corpus Linguistics mean to you? Well, that's a great question and a very difficult to answer at the same time. Um, I suppose corpus linguistics is a is a powerful set of uh, tools and research methods to ex uh, look at language use. Um, in my case, I sort of find that the same toolbox of tools and methods can be used with uh, both uh, L1 and L2 languages. So this is something that allows me to look at usage, language use from different camps. Uh, one camp is in descriptive linguistics, if you will, or linguistics, and the other is in language learning. So both camps, in a way, uh, allow us researchers and linguists to look at uh, variation and the uh, circumstances that uh, shape up uh, language uh, use. Um, yeah, I suppose um, I can quote here uh, Tony McHenry in a recent uh, interview, or, or better, in a recent conversation that Jill Mark and myself had with Tony McHenry and uh, uh, Professor Mike McCarthy. And he said something which I think is really interesting. He said that uh, some people feel stunned that we linguists uh, sometimes don't use uh, data mm. to look at language. And this is something that you forget when you become a corpus linguist, uh, a corpus linguist uh, uh, I suppose. So yeah, it's this interest in data that really is, is, is you know, um, something that we do every day. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, how did you on a personal level, how did you get involved in corpus linguistics in your career as a researcher? Uh, well, um, my main interest back in today, back in the, I suppose, mid 90s was um, applying linguistics and language learning. I was teaching uh, adults back then, and uh, I mean people, you know, from 16 year olds to people in their 60s or 70s, right? So that was my that was my target group. So as you can imagine, that was a very interesting uh, uh, situation and context to teach languages. So I became really interested in 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 uh, how people of different ages actually process and use language. So that was something that. Uh, caught my attention back then. So I wanted to look at uh, this learning process and I started uh, to look at the role of emotion in, in language learning. And then I became involved in 
in the work of Professor Elaine Horwich uh, at the University of Texas at Austin. So I went there. I remember that was, I think, 1998, if I remember well. Uh, back then, the internet was was not huge. I mean, you could use the internet for email and all that, but certainly you couldn't find everything on the internet as you can do now. So I spent uh, some time there, and I learned more about factor analysis. And as you can imagine, factor analysis and data reduction techniques so much you know used in in looking at the psychometric properties of surveys in, in psychology and in, in some applied linguistics research, that in a way led me to an interest in the use of factor analysis in language research. And this is how I discovered multidimensional analysis. And to me, that was the beginning of my love and interest and passion for corpus linguistics. Basically, I can say that is discovering that you can use data reduction statistics with uh, or for the analysis of language brilliant and we'll we'll, we'll get back to that uh sticky topic of multi-dimensional analysis a little bit later on um yes. i, I want to start by um picking a particular theme of of your research and and there's a few terms that are related to this um data-driven learning mobile language learning as a form of data-driven learning um, and you've done work building uh, what you might call pedagogic corpora, encouraging um, learners to actually use corpus data themselves. And this is different to um, a lot of the discussions of applying corpus linguistics, of course, is about a researcher studying a corpus and finding something out about language and then telling people about what they found in the corpus as a contribution to knowledge and practice in whatever field they're interested in. But in your context, this, this strand of your research is actually about getting people who are not academic researchers, and they may be language learners or, and or teachers, for instance, to actually do corpus analysis themselves. Um, so I imagine that's quite a challenging area uh, for those who are not um, experience in, in doing linguistic research, as of course many language learning uh, language uh, students are not. So why don't you tell us more about your, your work in this area, the creation of pedagogic corpora and, and, and how you try to encourage um, uh, getting corpus linguistics actually into language learning contexts? Yeah, well, I have to probably travel back a little bit in, in time here. And um, uh, I really have to throw here a few names that were really inspiring in, in that search. And I want to talk about Henry Widowson as, as somebody that started to really uh, look at the use of corpora in a more, let's say, in, in a critical way. Mm. And... Um, those that are probably over 40 and certainly 50 will remember fantastic uh, uh, um, conversations between uh, John Sinclair and Henry Widdowson uh, back in the day. I'm thinking about uh, talk in Bertinoro, for example, um, uh, where there was, the, you know, there was this conversation between Henry Widdowson and applied linguist himself, probably very much concerned about language learning and language teaching methodology and the use of corpus data to sort of promote uh, authentic language learning. And of course, John Sinclair uh, representing the major, I suppose, uh, um, you know, just uh, um, work in, in the field of corpus linguistics uh, in the, uh, certainly in the, in the 90s and in the early 2000s. Um, so uh, one of the things that Henry Witherson was worried is that the use of corpus data, such as, for example, corpus uh, data from the BNC, the British National Corpus, that could possibly not be representative or authentic to language learners uh, in a you know a sort of a mainstream learning classroom context. And um, I remember also back then a nice paper by I think it's. Uh, uh, mission mission to 2004, mission 2005, where there was a discussion of uh, authenticated contexts. And of course, the work of, uh, of Sabina Brown, uh, 
uh, at that time in the University of uh, Tübingen, uh, talking about early efforts to sort of make corpus data more palatable to language mm -hmm. learners, mm -hmm. uh, not only in higher education, but also in secondary uh, education. Um, so um, back then, the idea was to sort of try to promote the use of corpus research methods in a way in the language classroom with the use of data that could be representative, not of uh, the main variety, for example, of, 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 of English as spoken in the UK or Italian as spoken in Italy or Spanish mm. as spoken in Spain, blah, blah. But uh, the language that is representative of the sort of tasks and functions, communicative functions that language learners needed uh, for their language learning. So this is how these two projects came in a way uh, to be. Uh, I'm talking about uh, SACO Dale. That is a terrible acronym. I know that uh, <laughs> I forgot the whole acronym <laughs> myself. Something like system aided. A compilation and distribution of European uh, youth language. Uh, that was a European project um, where we put together a uh, corpus of interviews with secondary school learners in seven languages, including, mm. as I said, uh, Italian, uh, English, French, German, uh, Lithuanian, Romanian. And um, in a way, those interviews were based on the sort of curriculum that language teachers across Europe felt was needed for mm. their uh, language uh, teaching and language learning in real secondary school classrooms. So the idea was to uh, take advantage of uh, both the know-how that we gained through trying to put together representative corpora of, you know, for example, English or uh, other languages, but this time trying to focus on the L2 classroom. So this is how we put together these, uh, these corpora. As you can imagine, I'm talking about 2008 mm -hmm. here, around 2008. So that was a very, you know, early days in mm -hmm. terms of technology and the internet. So uh, um, much of the product is mm -hmm. not available uh, anymore uh, um, in terms of the uh, multimodal interviews or videos the whole text can be accessed uh, through different websites. And the interesting idea is here that we can use pedagogic annotation. So uh, one layer of these uh, sort of distribution of the corpus was the pedagogic annotation carried out by language teachers themselves. So they annotated every single interview, uh, as we call them, every single section in mm -hmm. the interview. Uh, bearing in mind pedagogic uses of those uh, short parts of the interviews. So, uh, as you can see, this is a, an application of both corpus design, sort of know-how mm. compilation, but also an application of some of the methodologies that were uh, uh, available back then in terms of using, for example, the TEI initiative mm -hmm. in terms of annotating uh, the corpora and also uh, trying to favor a more language learning oriented sort of, sort of search uh, environment um, where learners could not only search for words or string of words, but where they could search for, for example, topics, topics mm. of interest in terms of the language learning, such as, for example, talking about uh, the holidays or mm. um, talking uh, about the environment, as mm. you can imagine, is one of all oh, these are the uh, representative of some of the uh, functions, communicative functions that we all need when we are learning languages, in, for example, in secondary education. I'm here, I'm talking mm. about you know, anything between A2 and B2 uh, levels. So, yeah, that was the Sacco Day project back then that was complemented by the Backbone project that looked more specifically at uh, um, uh, these languages plus uh, a corpus of English as a lingua franca, 
contributed by professionals uh, uh, across the board, you know, just uh, um, researchers, engineers, uh, uh, um, um, people working in, 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 you know, small shops mm. that uh, spoke about some of the topics that uh, we felt were of interest to, you know, just uh, uh, professionals uh, across Europe. So we use the same sort of methodology and the same uh, pedagogic corpora uh, um, principles that I talked about earlier. So in a way, what I really find of interest is uh, how we, in a way, we were able to transform the idea of um, uh, representative corpora into representative corpora in language learning, which, mm. as you can see, these are, they entail, they, they are different things. So we are not talking here about representative, uh, in a way, youth language. Mm -hmm. So our main drive was not to capture the you know the wide range of different ways in which uh, um, for example uh, young people uh, secondary school learners uh, uh, spoke um, uh, across different languages but mm. our interest was in uh, developing a corpus of multimodal corpora where learners could actually see good examples that could be authenticated against some of the learning tasks that they could find in their classroom uh, environment. So I think this is an interesting application of, of corpus linguistics in, in this case, the language education. And I think there is, obviously there is room for mm. uh, you know, a wide variety of similar applications and not only in language learning, but also in other areas of, of, of education. So this is, this is really interesting. You, you, you know, you sort of started relatively early on in the in the uh i suppose wave of research that's in, sort of suggesting it could be a good idea for language learners to be able to play with linguistic data sets themselves particularly as you say in this case it's it's not necessarily a corpus of the target language variety but a corpus of um how learners like themselves are using the target language in in general, I, I've I've seen research that you know has talked about the 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 benefits and the the limitations or, or the challenges of um, spreading the word about data driven learning. Obviously, you said you started this work some time ago when you know computer technology, the internet, etc., was not, um, of course, as as widespread as it is now. Some of the challenges I've heard are relating to a lack of uh, confidence in being able to use um, the technology, for instance, or not necessarily understanding how looking at, you know, large samples of, of data might be able to, to help. Is, do you still see that as the case now? Um, do you see that data-driven learning is being embraced more so now, or are there still barriers uh, in your experience that, that still make it difficult to to argue uh, in favor of that approach? Um, well, if we look at research in, in data-driven learning, uh, what we find, I think, is the, is the opposite, I suppose. Um, we see that uh, there is more and more uh, interest coming from, uh, you know, just across the board. So we're, mm -hmm. we're talking here about more languages are being used in, in data-driven learning. And as you know, it used to be English uh, dominated uh, sort of uh, landscape, so, so mm. to speak. Uh, now you see more and more languages uh, that also are, you know, benefit from uh, data driven learning. And, uh, and I suppose that research is, uh, in a way, is telling us that data driven learning is a very effective way to look at. Um, uh, or to examine um, usage uh, mm. in the classroom. Mm. Uh, there is, I think, there is a couple of, of areas that probably need further attention. I think uh, most of the research, uh, uh, I'm not thinking about here, uh, the um, meta-analysis by uh, uh, Alex Bolton and... Um, and um, 
and, and, and others uh, mm -hmm. that have looked at the um, at the amount of research in this area. And it seems that most of his research is looking at university students. And mm -hmm. as I said earlier, it's English. And I want to add here that is in the context of writing instruction. Mm -hmm. So probably we know quite a lot about data-driven learning in, in this area. But I think we need further research that is looking at, for example, data-driven learning mm -hmm. in other areas. Um, thinking about, for example, the work by uh, um, um, Gregory Hadley and, 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 and uh, associates looking at data-driven learning and reading, extensive reading. So they've had a kind of a four-year project looking mm -hmm. at the impact of data-driven learning on, on extensive reading, which is a fantastic uh, research, new insights into that, into that area. And... Um, but also I'm thinking about what you said about technology. Um, we know that uh, the emphasis is, is, is slightly moving from technology uh, to learning. Mm. So while I agree that the emphasis was on technology, let's say, I don't know, like two decades uh, uh, yeah. ago, uh, I find that uh, there is less and less um, in a way, um, uh, teachers and researchers worried about the impact of using these technologies in the in the language classroom. And uh, one of the reasons why I think uh, uh, probably one of the reasons why things like or corpora like Psychoday are not usable, uh, you know, these days. I mean, in practical terms, right? Mm -hmm. It's because you depend on a wide range of different technologies. You need to mm -hmm. access the, the the internet and then you need to download that file and then you need to download a media player that can play that particular file. So where the expectation in education these days is that you draw your tablet and you uh, simply make use of the resources that are mm -hmm. available to you. And uh, so that expectation probably is telling us that um, probably that's the that's the way forward. And in a way, uh, if we want to make full use of mm -hmm. the opportunities that uh, language learning in the 21st century can offer to educators, we really need to uh, move our you know our our, our infrastructure to web mm -hmm. services that can really take advantage of, of mobile devices. So in a way, I think I think we are no longer in a position where, and I'm here thinking about uh, Stephen Beck's uh, uh, normalization theory in computer assisted language learning. So his emphasis was on how to normalize the use of computers in the language learning classroom. So I'm, I'm thinking that research now, um, again, 21st century, well into mm. the third decade of the 21st century uh, tells us is that probably uh, teachers and certainly language learners no longer worry about, you know, the, uh, um, the logistics behind mm -hmm. deploying or using corpora. So the corpora are expected to be available uh, through your uh, web browser. And... Uh, that's, I think that's really good news. I think we probably, uh, just to finish, <laughs> probably uh, we educators, we need to do a better job in terms of how we think about interfaces. And here I want to uh, think about work that I contributed with my own research team, but also I want to think about research by Nina Vyatkina and also Fanny Munir that um, uh, sort of uh, discuss how to bring data-driven learning to the classroom in a way that is, again, it's more palatable and it is uh, something that both teachers and learners uh, want, to, want to use. Mm. So from what you're saying, it seems that we're moving away from, you know, here's a program that you need to download, here's the data that you need to download, and you need to follow a million steps before you can actually get on to doing the task. Now it's kind of a pick up and play model where you take whatever device you have, whether it's a phone or a tablet or a laptop or a machine, whatever, and it's all there on the browser and much easier to access, I guess, much more user friendly um, 
which I think is, yeah, I agree. I think that's that's absolutely the way to go. Thank you. That's that's really interesting. I, I want to move on um, to another strand of your research. Uh, you you have an interest in in spoken uh, data, spoken uh, learner data. Um, I also have an interest in spoken data, but spoken um, L1 uh, English data, but spoken corpora um, are near and dear to my heart uh, as well. Um, you've done a lot of work on adverbs, um, which, as as your research and the, the research of others has shown convincingly, they perform an awful lot of very, very useful functions in spoken communication, many more than people would probably um, first think. Um, so what you know what interests you about adverbs in the context of learner language why why are they so important and and what have you learned in in your research into adverbs um well i suppose my interest in adverbs um probably uh spring out of a curious mind that is mm -hmm. interested in why adverbs are so marginal in in language education mm. as uh, opposed to to you know other word classes of course we're talking here about nouns and verbs mm. i mean yeah of course <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, but clearly adverbs still are my my impression and i my understanding robbie is that you have a nice paper with with naya curry and olivia goodman on this one which is really <laughs> really interesting and so my, you. my <laughs> no yeah it's uh, you know you 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 bring here an interest in you know what the you know publishing houses major publishing houses do with adverbs and the sort of data which is available mm -hmm. in terms of corpora uh, out there and how this, this is streamlined into major publications mm -hmm. and to be honest i'm also interested in that in that uh, area myself and um so, um, well, I suppose, uh, I suppose there is um, there is two layers of interest here. One is what um, learners do when they, uh, for example, write an essay or they uh, take part in an in a, a oral interview, and and how they use adverbs in this context and. Mm -hmm. Of course, this context is a context where adverbs are not elicited, right? So they are observed, but we are not seeking to elicit uh, adverbs. So uh, as, as opposed to other research methodologies where uh, probably researchers are trying to uh, elicit uh, adverb-driven uh, or adverb-rich responses, right? So we are trying to look at how these natural use of adverbs in the language classroom uh, looks like so that's been a part of, of that's been part of, of, of my research uh, um, uh, in, in in the last years um, and I, I really have to say here that uh, of course all of these research is mediated by the uh, availability of of corpora so I've been using, in terms of spoken uh, data, my main corpus has been the Lindsay, mm. uh, developed by uh, UCL, um, and the team led by Sylvia and Granger, uh, which is a fantastic resource to explore uh, spoken language. And in terms of written language, I've, I've looked uh, at more at the uh, ICCI, uh, led by Yuki Otono and uh, uh, really uh, very international uh, 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 corpus data. When I say very international, I mean some countries that are not usually represented in most corpora are part of this of, the, of, of this corpus and also a, a corpus that looks at very young uh, writers uh, mm. uh, of, in this case, uh, English, right? Um, so if I was to summarize my main findings, probably uh, you would think, well, that's not really very exciting. <laughs> my main findings are uh, it takes at least uh, seven or eight years of instruction for learners to start using corpora mm. in writing. Um, 
overuse and underuse phenomena, of course, are observed in spoken data. Uh, and here we could talk about the use of teddy bear uh, adverbs and so on, and, uh, and the lack uh, of sophistication in the use of some of the adverbs, such as, for example, the use of actually, for example, mm -hmm. in, 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 in spoken L2 language. But also I was thinking that uh, from a more theoretical perspective, just uh, looking at these sort of uh, um, underuse, for example, mm -hmm. is really misleading to the general public as these uh, discussions about underuse are not just looking at, um, let's say, the low frequency. So what is really interesting here is the strategies that are used by learners to sort of compensate this lack of engagement with a mm. particular use of an adverb that in normal circumstances would be used by an L1 speaker. Mm. And that it is, you know, yeah. quote unquote, uh, <laughs> quote unquote, everything that I say here, because all of these findings are, of course, based on uh, the exploration of L1 corpora that, of mm. course, offer and present uh, limitations. So, um, and I was thinking that probably the uh, most striking and uh, interesting finding here is how these small words are used in language teaching, mm. how little attention they are paid in language teaching, really? and how small room they get in test books or mm. in you know everyday teaching. Uh, so they're typically dismissed as... Uh, words that can be translated into into uh, into one uh, uh, adverb in the L2 language mm. or, or in the L1 language uh, mm. of the L2 learners. And uh, that, in a way, simplifies the fabric of spoken communication, how complex the fabric of spoken communication uh, tends to be. So, in a way, let me link back to the notion of pedagogy corpora that we discussed earlier on, and uh, those um, efforts to bring even small amount of data. I mean, in terms of you know thousands or even mm. yeah, thousands of of words to the language classroom. Uh, here, these pedagogy corpora can serve as a great starting point to examine some of the most interesting um, uh, cases where small words are used by, in this case, L1 speakers mm. and show the way in which these could potentially be used by L2 learners if they feel this is something that they may want to, to use as well. And finally, I want to say that uh, there is there is a nice wealth of research that shows that there is a lack of understanding on uh, uh, about race or awareness in language education, which I think, and probably we will discuss this in a in a few minutes. I think we are in a, a very good position to sort of try to do something about it, uh, mm -hmm. thanks to a range of tools that we can we can use when talking about. Um, um, you know, corpus applications in language education. Mm, absolutely, that's 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 really interesting. You, you're right that there's so much that, um, of course, so many functions that adverbs perform, and yet they 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 don't get the attention that they deserve. So it's it's good to see that you're sticking up for the the little uh, <laughs> the little words um, that you know that ought to deserve uh, more attention. Um, now I want to move on to to I, I promised myself that we wouldn't get bogged down in technical methodological conversations here on Corpus Cast, and I'm going to try and stick to my promise. Um, however, uh, you have done a lot of work with multidimensional analysis, which is a, a very well established um, approach or series of approaches in in Corpus linguistics, and has been for many decades. Um, students of corpus linguistics who are new to the field um, often get a bit put off by this because it's relatively more technical compared to some of the the, uh, the other methods that are introduced in the study of language. So um, this might be a challenge to kind of talk about it without talking about it, but um, what can you learn 
by counting up lots of the, the, the frequencies of lots of different linguistic features, grammatical features, frequency data, etc. What can you learn by counting them up and comparing them across lots of different texts? I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. <laughs> Well, that's that's another great question. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could have an hour or. or, or so. <laughs> well, we'll have uh, to have you back on. Obviously, oh, right. <laughs> well, that's that's a great question. Um, well, I suppose we can. Um, um, I mean, this is. Uh, I suppose this is the beauty about using uh, uh, corpus linguistics. So you can be as much, you know, microscopic, so to speak, mm -hmm. as you want. So, for example, you could look at actually uses in 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 corpus data. So you could actually go deeper into, for example, you could examine every single use, and you could try to understand every you know sort of uh, pragmatic function be mm. uh, behind the use of of actually something that I've done myself, and I really find really uh, uh, interesting. But of course, this is something that you can do uh, uh, within the limits of, for example, as in, in this case, one adverb and a very uh, uh, small data set, I suppose. Yeah. So what happens when uh, you can, instead of looking at one single linguistic feature or lexical item, you can look at all of them? Mm. So uh, this is beautiful because you can make use of data reduction techniques. Yeah. All right. And this is where we can benefit from, for example, in a, a, a factor analysis. So uh, when we talk about multidimensional analysis, really, we're talking about a factor analysis uh, applied to the analysis and, and the study of uh, features, linguistic features in um, in texts or across texts. And uh, so what you can get here is the opposite. You gain or you can gain a wider picture. You get the large picture of mm -hmm. what's going on in terms of how different features are, are used in terms of frequency, but also how those frequencies are distributed across different texts. And that gives you a very unique perspective of of the text as uh, something that goes beyond the use of, you know, discrete lexical items, such mm. as the case of actually. So just to give you a very probably, uh, I suppose, um, um, just uh, just uh, this is just an example, right? Um, so I um, in the in the Lindsay corpus that I mentioned earlier. Uh, there is a sort of task where learners and, well, both learners, but also uh, uh, English L1 speakers or native speakers uh, look at a, a story in four pictures. I mean, the nature of what's going on there is not totally clear, although mm -hmm. there is some, you know, if you've seen the picture, you know what I mean. Um, uh, maybe I can I can give you the picture later. I don't know. <laughs> so what's what's going on there is that there is a lady that is being painted by a, a painter, and obviously the lady is not happy with the mm -hmm. with the uh, with the final uh, painting. So I mean, you can hypothesize uh, as much as you want here, and of course you can throw in your imagination here and mm -hmm. go as far as you want. Of course, yeah. but you know it's 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 pretty straightforward. Okay, so uh, what we have here is uh, uh, interesting data in terms of, of how people, both L1 speakers and L2 speakers, reconstruct what's going on in, in these pictures, all right? So what happens is when we look at what learners do and what, uh, in this case, uh, English L1 speakers do, is really interesting uh, uh, when you use, for example, uh, multidimensional analysis. In other words, when we use a factor analysis, a data reduction technique that in a way uh, tells us about the frequencies of different linguistic features and how those lingu linguistic features actually are distributed across the different texts in uh, single data sets. So, um, for example, what um, happens with uh, Spanish speakers when they when they describe what's going on here 
is that they they make use of a, a sort of uh, spoken English that is very involved in in you know in 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 its nature. Mm. So they use lots of uh, as Doug Biber calls them private verbs, so uh, opinion verbs. Mm. So the frequency of opinion verbs is mind blowing. <laughs> Um, when you look at what L1 English speakers do here is that, well, they use the sort of uh, expected amount of uh, opinion verbs uh, in terms of face-to-face of, uh, -face, uh, interaction. So, okay, you may say, well, that's something which is not very interesting. And uh, I can tell you here that it is very interesting because when you look at the different underlying dimensions of use, you understand what's going on here. So, for example, let me just very briefly talk about Spanish speakers in the Lindsay while they sort of uh, look at these four pictures and describe mm -hmm. what's going on here. So they use a type of production that is very involved. So if I give you like a score of, for example, in this case, it's 38.9. That's the mean score for this, uh, let's say, uh, factor or dimension mm -hmm. of this. And I tell you that uh, uh, English uh, L1 speakers, they uh, get a mean of 24.6. That means nothing, but you can, you, I mean, simply by looking at these two numbers, but you can really tell that there is a huge difference in terms of how Spanish speakers uh, um, make use of these uh, uh, involvement features mm. in a situation which is not expected. Because I mean, you are you are expected to tell a story here of what's mm. going on. Yeah, uh, but at the same time, uh, they show fewer features uh, of narrative uh, English than. English speakers. So mm. the mean score in that dimension is, you know, so different between L1 speakers and L2 uh, speakers. Uh, L1 English speakers uh, are so much more situation dependent. Spanish speakers are so much more explicit about the mm. situation. Um, English L1 speakers are not at all uh, 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 persuasive about their version of what's going on in the story. Spanish speakers, they really try very hard to be persuasive. So most of this, and, and I will stop there. So this is telling you that there is lots of things going on here in terms of the use of the language mm -hmm. that you know, are not easily met by, easily by the eye, just by looking at the frequency of this adverb or that particular noun or mm. preposition. When you gain this uh, sort of perspective, you see how different uh, reasons or underlying dimensions uh, of use, as Dr. Biber calls them, how they actually uh, interplay and interface with each other. And in a way, uh, these may contribute each one to sort of protecting a view of these L2 use mm. uh, as opposed to what is expected from L1 use based on, you know, uh, the frequencies that we sort of expect to be there in a particular mm. type of discourse. I mean, this is interesting because we don't normally, even in our L1, we don't usually describe pictures, right? This is like, a, yeah. you know, what yeah. is sort of, um, um, you know, a very interesting kind of um, uh, elicitation uh, yeah. task. But um, yeah, I think I think this is just uh, this is just the beginning where you can start to 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 look at again. Uh, don't 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 get me wrong. This is this is not something that. We researchers, and you know this very well, we do just to show how deficient L2 language is. That's mm. not the main drive here. We're trying to understand how learning works, All right? So, yeah, and, and, and uh, to do that, we corpus linguists, we have decided to look at usage.
and by understanding better how learning works, we can um, promote uh, better practices in teaching. And by identifying some of these really otherwise undetectable linguistic gaps between languages, which often relates also, of course, to culture and, and other related issues, you can then go in presumably into teaching materials and say, okay, when, when Spanish L1 Spanish speakers are learning English as a second language, um, they, you know, the, 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 I suppose the, the categories of words at a conceptual level that they might use in a certain situation in Spanish should not just be directly translated into their English equivalent. You sort of, there's a gap there that you're identifying a bridge that must be crossed when switching from one language to another, which is fascinating. Um, I think that's such a clear, such a clear sort of picture of, of the, the, the power of these sorts of approaches. So thank you for sharing that. Um, as, we, as we start to wrap up, and, and goodness, we could talk about this all day, I'm sure. Um, I wanna to touch a little bit on, on the work that you've done to um, try to encourage practitioners and researchers in uh, education broadly, but of course, language education, um, particularly to, um, to incorporate corpus linguistics in some way. We talked about DDL, but of course, in research themselves, and, and there are a lot of teachers that are known as, um, uh, they're, 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 they're doing research as well themselves, sometimes in their own practice. Um, you recently published a book called Corpus Linguistics for Education, uh, a guide for research, which uh, I read and found um, really, really, really interesting. Um, I think that that book may have been published almost a year ago now, potentially, um, or thereabouts. Um, what's the, if you've, you know, what's the sort of reception been in terms of people who've had a chance to look at it? And have you heard from people who've sort of said, oh, you know, um, I never really knew anything about this before, but someone sort of recommended this book and and now I'm starting to, you know, have, have you noticed any, it might be a bit early, of course, because obviously, as as we know, the publication process and dissemination can be very slow and sometimes you don't notice the effect of the work you've done for many years. So, um, but I wonder if you've had any, any early reception so far from that work. Yeah, well, that's an interesting question. Uh, uh, it's, uh, well, um, again, um, I suppose we are living strange times as yeah. we speak. Of course, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, oh, it's just uh, uh, incredible how mediated uh, uh, are the way we talk to other people now are by, I suppose, um, uh, uh, the internet and electronic communication. Mm -hmm. And this is a very good <laughs> instance. Yeah, of, yeah exactly. <laughs> of that yeah i've been i've been contacted by really uh uh quite a few faculties uh, here and there that really want uh want me to speak about corpus linguistics in their mm -hmm. research methods um uh, uh programs and i think that was one of the uh, original ideas behind uh this book all right oh there it here. is yeah so yeah <laughs> so it was uh, I was I was teaching a, a corpus linguistics uh, uh, session in the Faculty of Education at the University of Cambridge. Mm. And I thought mm, maybe it's a good idea to you know just uh, to write something about it. So that was the original um, or one of the original um, uh, motivations to to write the book. So to sort of try to bring this book or to tr you know try to bring corpus linguistics uh, methods to a wider uh, audience uh, mm. I suppose. So in that way yeah, I think it's 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 uh, it's been successful in attracting the attention of of players uh, outside uh, corpus linguistics. Um also I think uh, most of my thinking time in this book was in two areas one area was pretty obvious was trying to make these as palatable as possible to yeah. To anybody dealing with, uh, especially corpus annotation, mm. and uh, of course, I have a talk about keyword analysis. So, I mean, of course, it's it's really uh, something you really need to uh, to give a, a sense of a very powerful research method that you can use, but also you need to 
to throw some caution there in, in, in terms of how this is used. If you are serious about uh, your 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 research and you want to use this in a robust way, mm. so that was one of the reasons. Uh, one of the areas that uh, really. Uh, uh, occupied my time while writing. The other was to really think about um, what does corpus linguistics mean or have to offer to, for example, educators that, for mm. example, make use of uh, 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 this uh, typical scenario where there, there are interviews and interviews are analyzed uh, thematically. So what is new about the use of corpus linguistic research mm. methods for these researchers that are so comfortable and so happy using, uh, for example, I don't know, uh, M vivo, for example, for uh, for their uh, analysis or thematic analysis, and for example, where M vivo also offers a uh, an automatic uh, um, uh, counting, word counting, and mm. uh, frequency counting. So uh, that's probably the area that took me longer to really to think about, right? And uh, if I am totally honest with you, I think this is a fascinating area that I think uh, I, in my case, I have just started to think about, and I hope that this this is a sort of conversation that we will have in the future with, with more researchers across different areas. But I feel that um, in a way, uh, I really find it fascinating that, for example, in the social sciences and in education, for example, as well, uh, language has been and is the primary source of uh, qualitative analysis. Mm. I think we will agree there. But, uh, however, uh, usage has remained invisible. So it is, you know, it is kind of a um, sort of parallel universe in, where in a universe there is an interest in language, but usage is uh, neglected. Mm. And there is, is this another uh, parallel universe, the universe of corpus linguists, where we all we care about is usage mm. and some of the forces that uh, uh, shape up usage, like uh, frequency or recency and distribution and well, of course, if, if you are, uh, um, or if, if, if you practice usage-based theories, there's a whole range of uh, interesting stuff to, to, to look at here. So, but these two universes, of course, they are parallel, so they don't, mm. they don't talk to each other. So in a way, what I was trying to do here is I was trying to sort of, uh, trying to, you know, get across the message that usage does matter. So mm -hmm. the words we choose matter because the words we think we choose are shaped mm -hmm. by social conventions and the way we are exposed to discourses around particular topics and particular areas of, of, of the topics that we talk about or the feelings that we want to convey or discuss or describe. Right. So I really find that this is a very fertile area that really needs uh, more attention in the social sciences. And I think um, that corpus linguists here can probably contribute to to uh, increasing the appreciation of, you know, what is the impact of usage mm -hmm. on the way uh, data is collected and analyzed in the social sciences. And of course, there is the impact of, of uh, research methods, like, for example, keyword analysis for, for the analysis of even, you know, something which could be pretty close to, to thematic analysis. So I think that is, um, that is a really uh, interesting area that really needs, uh, really needs more, uh, more attention. And also, I think that um, if, if I have one one minute here, Robbie, uh, I, I, I want to say that uh, in a way, corpus linguistics is is very well situated to do this. As now there is an interest in you know you know there is this notion that we are surrounded by data and that mm. uh, big data for the good or for the bad mm. is, is all around us and and. Um, 
I don't think we corpus linguists are afraid of the big data revolution in any way. Mm. Mm. I think in a way we are we are ready. Yeah. But it's kind of big data. Come on, br bring it. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we are we are we are not scared. Mm. But at the same time, we also uh, f we know very well that there is these. I'm, I'm, in, I'm here talking about uh, education. There is these new uh, ecologies for reading and writing, uh, and and these new ecologies are digital ecologies of reading mm -hmm. and writing. So there is this interface for us corpus linguists to really make an impact in terms of of how this is researched and mm -hmm. how, we, in a way, we can interface. Uh, and also be a sort of uh, a stakeholder in the conversations that let's call them um, um, computer scientists and and the society uh, has and I think we can contribute our understanding of usage and language as something that is situated socially and these courses mm. which is something that probably is not obvious mm. to scientists so yeah in a way i feel that's both it's 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 the beauty of the work that we have uh, ahead uh and also is the is the big challenge that the big that challenge have. indeed <laughs> thank you okay we're gonna wrap things up now with three quick fire questions um the questions are quick but we'll see if the answers are quick as well um first one uh what is the biggest change um, that you've noticed in corpus research during your own career? Okay, so, yeah, I'll be brief. So I suppose one is we've become more sophisticated in mm -hmm. two different ways. We've become more sophisticated in how we uh, interface Corpus analysis and corpus linguistics research methods and theory. And when I talk about theory, for example, I'm talking about language learning theory, such as usage-based mm -hmm. uh, theories. But also, I'm talking about I don't know discourse analysis, like representation theory, or um, um, I've, I've become interested in in, in Bev Skeg's person value theory to look at uh, um, migration discourses. Uh, for example, with my colleague uh, Elena Remigi. So that's one change. So we become more sophisticated in how we interface with, um, you know, mm, uh, theories, right? Mm. And also, I think that the overall quality and the standard of our research, I think, has uh, in, in a way benefited from, uh, you know, increasing sophistication in how we use quantitative methods. Mm in our research, but also we become more sophisticated in sort of trying to to um, tell society about our findings. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I suppose this, this uh, podcast or, 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 or um, video cast is, is a good example of that, right? So I think this is something that was unthinkable just a few mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's a that's that's a good point. Um, what has surprised you the most about your work in corpus linguistics, personally? Um, well, I suppose um, I suppose is how versatile corpus linguistics research methods uh, can be, and how they have the potential to to interest a wide range of of, of scientists or researchers uh, across the board. Um, so yeah, uh, last month I was uh, I was in 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 uh, the University of Minho in Portugal, giving a workshop on using corpus linguistics to research uh, hate speech, mm. and it was really in, uh, uh, interesting to see these. Uh, um, linguists and uh, uh, NLP professionals um, in a way just uh, trying to understand how they could benefit from using corpus linguistics mm. methods and looking at things again from a more usage-based uh, perspective 
And um, I, th I think I really believe that corpus research, corpus linguistics research methods have have these um, these you know, presents this affordance. You know, it can be mm -hmm. of interest to uh, a very wide range of uh, scientists. So, yeah, to be honest, this, yeah, this has surprised me uh, because, um, you know, back, I don't know, 15 or 20 years ago, probably, I thought of corpus linguistics as a very, uh, sort of very small area of mm -hmm. research that mm -hmm. could only be of interest to, to uh, all of us doing corpus linguistics, yeah. And finally, looking to the future, um, how will corpus linguistics, uh, I should say, continue to make an impact on the world in the future? Where do you think we're going? Well, um, yeah, I think, um, as, as, as I said, I think we are in, in a position to, to become sort of relevant actors in, in a future where, um, I suppose um, digital communication uh, will be dominant, mm. uh, meaning that most of uh, of communication is uh, online, and there will be a, a blend of text and image and sound that can be analyzed. Uh, so I think we are, as I said, in a very good position to be. Uh, relevant actors there, but I think we also need to increase our understanding of NLP mm -hmm. and you know, artificial intelligence, such as you know, machine learning. Uh, so to sort of try to understand how we can contribute to this big revolution that is happening uh, right now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, I'm thinking about people like uh, Scott Crossley, Chris Kyle. I think they are leading the way in in, in which you know uh, the way how we can we can do this. But I think we can also talk about uh, maybe our own PhD students. They now come with all sorts of you know uh, new tool, uh, toolboxes like I don't know data mining methods. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them know how to program in Python and they make mm -hmm. use of R. So, you know, that's, that's so refreshing. And mm. of course, uh, uh, all of these can, can only be of interest because, you know, we can, we can probably build on the work by, of people like John Sinclair, Michael Huey, Tony McHenry, Stephen Grease, and the like. Mm. So mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm really positive about the impact that, that we can make in the, uh, in the future, whatever mm. the future. <laughs> is. but I think we can interface with this big revolution that is certainly uh, taking place as we speak and which uh, makes use of of language of, mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, and uh, but doesn't look at language and mm -hmm. of course doesn't um, take into account usage uh, in looking at language so mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty much. I think we have a a role there. Mm. Oh, that's an, an an optimistic way to to end the episode. Uh, thank you very much, Pasquale. This has been really really fascinating conversation. I really appreciate your time. Um, of course, uh, for those of you watching, if you're interested in learning more about uh, corpus linguistics research going on here at Aston, then you can follow the. Aston Corpus Linguistics Research Group on Twitter at Aston Corpus. Um, this brings us to the the end of our uh, episode of Corpus Cast. So once again, uh, Pasquale Perez Paredes, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I really enjoyed this conversation. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Robbie, and um, and congratulations on this initiative. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>